Okay, so welcome. Are you guys regulars of Nature Time? Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you, you read it? Okay. Um, so uh, my name is Laurel Sterling, and I'm the registered dietitian here. And I do offer a free service uh, for people to consult with me if, if there's any health issues that you have that you're concerned about. Uh, and this is something that we wanted to put together working with Mega Foods, which we've done two, I think two of their other workshops. One was on spontaneous happiness with Dr. Andrew Weil, and then there was another one that we did. It was on um, community spirit and gardening, things like that, lo going local. So this is one that they um, thought would be great, obviously, this time of year. We probably should have had it done in November, but it was a little late in coming. Hello, welcome. <laughs> How are you? Good. You can have a seat. And there's some, just I put on some of the chairs, just some stuff um, right there. We don't have too many people. The weather just kind of, you know, people fell off as a result. So, again, how I run these lectures are you can ask questions throughout. You don't need to hold till the end. Um, how this works is there are a lot of videos. There's at least about six or seven different videos. Um, so I'm going to be going back and forth between the PowerPoint and the videos. Um, and you guys have on your chair one of these sheets that I will be referring to for you to keep, as well as this booklet, which I'll be going through, and it, and it follows right along with the slides, too. If you want the lights on, I could put the lights on in the back, or is it okay? I mean, some people prefer, okay. Um, and uh, there are some areas where there's some group discussion where we may talk just a little bit about a few things on here. So I'm going to run the first video, which just gives an introduction to Dr. Lodog. She's a fabulous um, MD, and uh, she's very integrative, works with Dr. Andrew Weil. I got a chance to meet her, and I've listened to a lot of her lectures. Um, She's just a, a beautiful person all around, and um, you know she walks obviously the talk. And um, so throughout, you're going to be listening to her videos. And I put some of these up here that I'll be referring to, because in some of the videos she talks about um, doing the nasal rinse with a neti pot and the lights, which in her she talks about um, in the book. It talks about a certain. Um, light therapy with certain lux, but when I was speaking to the um, educator, the naturopath, Dr. Aaron Stokes, she said that Dr. Lodog really likes the um, one that's like the rise and shine, where it slowly, progressively comes on and simulates how um, the sun coming up would be. So she really likes that one. And I pulled from our needs company, and I have some of our uh, catalogs up here, but we carry these two products through needs, and then just a few other things that she talks about nutrition-wise and supplemental. And uh, the samples that you have, I'll be talking about those towards the end, and I actually had the mega food uh, rep come in too, so if you have any specific questions for him on any this product or any of the other products, you can ask him. He's milling about out there as well. Okay. So let me start this first one. Hi, I'm Dr. Aaron Stokes, Medical Director with MegaFood. Hi, and I'm Dr. Tironi Lodog, and we're delighted to be here with you today. We're so glad to welcome you to the Winter Seasonal Therapeutics Community Workshop, where we're coming together to learn about lifestyle, nutrition, and supplements, and how to be proactive in this winter season, especially around immune health and mood. Hi, I'm Dr. Aaron Stokes, oh, Medical Director with MegaFood. Hi, and I'm Dr. Tironi Lodog, and we're delighted to be here with you today. Sorry. We're so glad to welcome you to the Winter Seasonal Therapeutics Community. Okay. Um, okay, so now back to the PowerPoint. Let me get that back. Okay. So, 
again, this follows along in here. So if you want to look uh, at that, I know it's harder with the light, but um, this is very important. A lot of people don't, well, I deal with a lot of seasonal affective disorder, and um, typically it starts, I don't know, around November. I know I myself, when we started earlier this year with um, the colder coming sooner, even though now we're just, just being hit with the winter effect of it. But um, I had many clients coming in that had already had depression issues, and they were feeling even more on the downside. And I, who don't typically get affected by the um, season, that I noticed myself that I was just feeling kind of, you know, flatlined with the changes because it came so soon, I think. So um, trying to get a jump on this and using different supplements, like I had one client who was taking about 2,000 vitamin D, and he said, well, somehow I, I had like two in my pocket, and I just took them, and it gave him a total of 4,000, and he said, I felt a real difference. And I said, well, typically I personally take about 4,000 this time of year. Um, that They've seen that when you're sick, Actually, your body uses up anywhere from three to 5,000 of vitamin D anyway per day. So I say as a general rule of thumb, about 2,000 vitamin D. Uh, you may get some in a, in a bone formula. If you're already getting one of those, you might get 1,000 there. And you might, in your multi, get another 1,000. So you know, just judge it. And, and it actually is uh, fat-soluble, so you do have to be careful. If your levels do get upwards to 90, 100, that's when you can have reach a toxicity level. But it's really rare that I've seen people hit that level. I've had two that came to me after, you know, I hadn't been dealing with them as a client, but they said, yeah, I was, I was already at 100, and so they were backing off on it. But most people, you want to keep your level upwards to around like 50. When you get your blood values, um, make sure it's around that. Because the research that they've seen with vitamin D, a lot of the health issues creep up typically um, when it's below 50. So that's why we hit, have that 50 mark that you want to try to keep it at. 50, I can't even remember, the lab unit, I don't know. I don't, but it's, it's, it's standard, yes. It's the 25 OHDD, that's what it's called, 25 OHD. That's what they usually... Okay. Oh, wow, so yours was really low. I've had some clients, yeah, I've had some clients come in with eight or nothing, non-existent. So, I mean, that's, and they've experienced, um, like, neuropathy issues and neurological issues. With food? Okay. Yep. Okay. Possibly. I mean, they'll, they'll give people uh, 50,000 once a week to, to slowly get it up, and that's a D2 form. It's not a D3. So, you know, that's fine. Just keep, keep it up until it starts really getting to that point, and then obviously you're going to back it down after that. Some people do take, like when I'm sick, I take about 10,000. Um, I use during that time period where I'm sick and then I back it back down to anywhere from two to four typically. So um, so you know you, you need obviously we need to be a little bit more proactive and that's where we want to be. If you know that you have issues during this time of year to start taking more of certain things on, and doing some certain activities and looking at your foods which is all of what we're going to be going over. So it's tied in together, mood and immune system. You know when your moods are low, your immune system typically is low as well. And there are certain things that they'll talk about, like sugars, for instance, keeps your immune system depressed for a good solid two hours, they've seen. So, um, and Dr. Lodog talks a bit about um, what happens with uh, the cravings of sugar. I mean, how many of you, I, I know I'm this way, I come home and I'm like, oh, I just want some 
cocoa and something warm and carby to eat this time of year just because we get into that warm hibernating mode and those typically aren't the foods that we should have. We should have more stews and soups with more protein in there and, and good fats. Um, so, and during this seasonal change, we also have low energy, low mood, as I already mentioned, craving carbs, weight gain, difficulty waking up in the morning. I know that was me. It's just like the sun. You know, I think this morning I knew I was up against snow blowing, and I said, I do not want to get <laughs> Thankfully, a farmer neighbor came with his big, huge tractor and just like did it all in you know five minutes, and I was so, um, but anyway, uh, also the immune issues that we have, and this is all in the, the booklet that I'm looking at here. Um, why is our immune system even more challenged in the winter? More time indoors, obviously more bugs, uh, the drier recycled air, more contact with others. Those are just some of the reasons why. Um, if you've got a lot of stress going on in your life, I remember I had this a couple of years ago, where I was taking everything under the sun, immune-wise, and I was sick from October through till April, at least. And I would just kind of ride at a low grade, and then I would go up, and then I would dip back down again, and, and I just kept going in and out of this illness. And um, someone had said to me, don't you really stress you under? And I said, I really wasn't thinking about that. And obviously, that was bringing my immune system down, and I couldn't fight it off. So then I switched to taking more of adrenal formulas and magnesium, and that's when I started to come out of this, you know, lag that I was in. So you have to really think about, you know, what is going on all around. Okay, so the light therapy um, is something that Dr. Lodog is going to get into, as well as um, she has a beautiful video, and you also have it in the booklet on how to make your own recipe, which I was going to do. Uh, but I didn't have any of the sunflower oil, but um, using the calendula and making your own uh, oil. Oh, this is called a dawn simulator. They call it a rise and shine, but she talked about a dawn simulator. Okay, so let's listen to what she has to say. Um, with the neti pot. It's really important during the winter months that you maintain good barrier protection. And your primary barrier actually against most you know, things that cause colds and upper respiratory infections is your nose. All right? The nose is lined with hair and the hair's job is, is actually to trap bacteria and virus and pollen. And that mucosa, the, the, the sort of wet, moist part inside the nose, acts like flypaper. And it literally traps things like virus and bacteria. That's what makes you sneeze. So you sneeze to get rid of these things, right? So the body is just working in this amazing way. Now, what you don't sneeze out, you'll swallow, right? And that's why you need good stomach acid, because that's where it kills all those things that maybe got past the nose. Now, when winter is around, most of the things that, most of the viruses that actually cause colds, they thrive in low humidity. And it's low humidity in the wintertime. We're inside more, we're using more heat, et cetera. So what we want to do is make sure that we're keeping the nasal mucosa nice and healthy and moist. One of the easiest ways you can do this is actually to make a good saline irrigation. To do that, you're going to take a quarter teaspoon of kosher salt. Now, it is important it's kosher. You do not want sea salt, and you don't want iodized salt. Iodine can irritate the nose of some people, and sea salt isn't perfectly clean. So you want kosher salt. One quarter teaspoon. I here. add That's baking here. soda because, let me tell you, um, if you're doing this fairly regularly, um, the salt begins to irritate. So you want to add a little baking soda to buffer the solution. So you take a quarter teaspoon of kosher salt and you take an eighth of a teaspoon of just baking soda. Then you're going to use a cup of water. Now it is important that the water be very clean because you're putting this up and rinsing the nasal cavity. So I generally use either a boiled water, just boil it in your tea kettle and then use it, or you can use bottled water. You take one cup and you pour it over and then I keep chopsticks around. They work perfect for stirring. And you're going to mix this up 
And then what you're going to do is you're going to use the neti pot. Um, you're going to lean over the sink and you're going to insert the neti pot up into one nostril and you're literally going to let it come out the other side. I know it sounds really weird. I know it does. This is a very ancient sort of remedy. But I want to remind you that when it comes to allergies, which many people suffer from, did you know that uh, when people use a neti pot daily, it reduces allergy medication by 65%. It's dramatic. So in the wintertime, humidify the air, use your neti pot at least three to four times a week. I use mine in the shower because it's just easier to do. I'm already in the shower, I've got my shampoo, and it's, I don't have to worry about it getting on anything. But use your neti pot three to four times a week, and it really will help maintain that barrier protection. Anybody use a neti pot regularly? Oh, very good. I, um, I have one, I have to be honest with you, I only use once, I've only used a couple times, and I used it at probably the wrong point where I had already had, it was blocked up so much that as I'm pouring it in, it just, you know, got stuck in there and it was burning my head and I was just like, oh, this is not a good experience. But there's other times that I've used it too, and I know that I have clients that have um, allergy issues that when they do this daily, like she had said, that they don't use their allergy medication at all. I mean, it would be. Yeah, that's right. With the back Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So uh, we we do carry the the neti pot, and we do have the the saline rinses and stuff that you can put in out there. Or as she has it right here on page seven in your booklet, it's all laid out how to um, make it yourself. And thank you for that, by the way. Right. Right. Mhm. Mm Perfectly fine. Some of the newer ones, what they have put in there is some things like grapefruit seed extract because it's extra anti-bacterial uh, and viral. So um, you'll see on some of the newer washes they have that component there, which it doesn't matter wh whichever um, you want to do. But it is very important um, to do, and I know personally I should do it more. But it is, yeah, when you have some bad experiences of <laughs> burning your nose. But some people use distilled water, and that is a big thing because I don't know if you guys had read some of the stuff that uh, was going on around the, out there with people, um, I think it was like amoebas or, you know, from the water that they were using directly. Yeah. Right. The water. It's the water. So either, like she said, boil it, use distilled, bottled water, or something like that. Right, yeah, that too. If you're not watching it, you can that too. Right, right. Yes. Yep, exactly. Yep, exactly. Um, oh, I should have kept that down because the other thing now that she talks about is skin. And in here, as I said, there's her recipe to make the um, calendula sunflower seed oil, which I thought was pretty cool. Where is it? Okay. One great thing you can do for your skin during the winter season is to just lather it with oil, especially after you get out of the shower or after you bathe. Uh, as we are inside more, the humidity is lower and it causes the skin to dry. One of my favorite oils that is just so easy for you to make um, is, is calendula, calendula oil. Now calendula um, is a beautiful flowering herb. You probably know it as pot marigold. And you take the flowers, or you can purchase these at many stores, and um, it's best when you're making an oil to use the dried calendula. Calendula is renowned for its ability to soothe and protect irritated skin. It's used a lot for diaper rash, it's used in eczema, used in a lot of these kind of um, problems that you get a lot of drying. Now this is just a canning funnel. I don't know if many of you may not can, but it makes it really convenient if you're trying to put your herbs into a, a, a glass jar like this. So what you do is you just take your dried calendula 
and you pack it into um, a jar, a mason jar that you can have a lid on it, and just loosely fill it. And now you can choose whatever oil you like. I really like sunflower seed oil because studies have actually shown that sunflower seed oil uh, is probably our best oil for maintaining barrier protection. So it seals in the moisture. I used to use a lot of olive oil, and I still love olive oil. But in a head-to-head -head trial, they actually found that olive oil um, diminished barrier function, so it didn't hold the moisture as well. So when we're looking for something for the winter time, I think sunflower seed oil is the best way to go. So just loosely fill your jar. Um, this is just um, you know, natural sunflower seed oil. This is organic, but you know, it doesn't have to be organic. You're applying it on your skin. And you just want to make sure that you saturate the um, flowers, and you want it to cover up about an inch over the flowers themselves. Now, this is going to need to sit for about two weeks, all right? So put it in a warm place, like in a windowsill or you know, someplace in the kitchen where it can, you know, you'll see it every day. Keep it in a warm place and shake it every single day. If after the first day it looks like, gosh, the flower sucked up all the oil, just add it. You want to keep it so it's got about an inch of oil over the flowers, okay? After you've let it steep for about two weeks, well, then you'll strain it out and um, put it in a nice dark colored jar. This can then be used for, you know, you can add essential oils to it. I usually add um, vitamin E oil to my oils because it just keeps them fresh longer. Um, how much do you use? Well, for every eight ounces of um, oil, of finished oil that you have, I usually put tea, uh, one to two teaspoons in there. Okay, so after your um, calendula oil has steeped for the two weeks, just put your lid on it, shake it. You want to make sure that that liquid is moving really freely through it. All right, after you strain it in two weeks, that's when you add your vitamin E oil or you could add some lavender oil, you could add some essential oils if you want. Remember, essential oils, um, if you want a 1% concentration, that's six drops per ounce. Six drops per ounce of finished oil that you have. That's a perfectly safe amount of essential oil to use, gives you a nice fragrance, but it's safe enough to use on a child or an adult in that strength. So anyway, a quick little recipe for you to do at your own home. Um, it's a lot less expensive than what you can buy at the store. You made it all by hand. And um, here's to healthy skin for the winter. I love those. It's just make it all yourself. Um, I use the calendula products from Walida. Is anybody familiar with those? Uh, when my daughter was a baby and um, I was at a conference and one of the um, girls that worked for Walida gave me a bunch of stuff. And I used the calendula, mm, I think it was a diaper rash, and that worked phenomenal for her. And then one time I put her in the bathtub, and I've always used the products from here, and I used one of the, uh, must have been a bath soap or whatnot that was orange. And I noticed after I got out of the tub, she had these areas where her hair was, um, I must have used a shampoo at that time, that had some orange in there, and it was all like a bright red. And I just, I was shocked because I hadn't dealt with that before. So I had some calendula oil, pure oil on hand, and so I just slathered it all over her, and then within about 10 minutes, that redness all went away. Um, so another time, I had her in the tub, and it was uh, some sort of a bath soap, and she came out of the whole tub, and she had, like, little blotches over her whole body. And again, I used the calendula. I slathered it all over, and I said, okay, apparently there's something with her with orange oil. <laughs> so I discontinued that. So she knows now, and she'll ask me, Is that, does that have orange in there? Because I can't use it. Um, because I frequently like some of the products that we have, like the orange vanilla lotions. And she'll say, oh, no, that's got orange. But um, the calendula worked phenomenal. So when I saw this, I thought, oh, this is great. I'm just going to try to make it on my own and just use that, you know, instead of having to buy the products out there. So, um, again, so you have these recipes right in here to take home with you. Um, so the next, um, okay. 
community. Community is a big part. This was one of the things that we talked about with the spontaneous happiness. Did any of you come to that? Were you with the spontaneous? The four-week one? No. Okay. Well, we talked a lot about community and how that um, plays a big part in your mood. Um, a lot of people that are older, um, more isolated from their family or friends, or a lot of their friends have passed away, um, Mood, their mood obviously goes out, and they said this is a huge, huge piece. Not if you don't have some sort of a community um, uh, in touch with the community in some way, whatever it may be. Um, so, what are some ways that you guys? I can tell you what I have. Um, I know that when I was dealing with uh, being a single mom and having to work and take care of my daughter, that I pulled away from this group of girlfriends. We have about ten of us, and that we would always have some dinners together or breakfast together. And, and at that point in time, I just couldn't financially as well as time-wise to, to go with them. So I noticed my mood just was really like <laughs> going down. And so one time last year when I, we had a party, one of my girlfriends has every year a Christmas party, and we all bring a dish and uh, we hang out. And I was laughing so hard. I mean, we were talking about hot flashes and how, because we're all at that point of perimenopausal. And, I mean, we were just laughing so hard, and I said, I have got to do more of this. I mean, it really made me feel a huge difference once I went in there and once I left. So I knew that I had to start pushing myself, regardless of um, the guilt of not, you know, having my daughter go to a babysitter and, and to go out when I should be staying with her. But I know that I need to have that for myself so that I can be better for her. So are there any things like that that you guys have that you want to share? I mean, some people have, um, like they're working out. Maybe they have a workout buddy or um, they play cards with a regular group or anything like that. Church. Church is a great one. Yes, church is another very important one. Thank you. Painting. Beautiful. My mom used to do things like that where she had friends that got together. They did ceramics. Um, so you're just painting like... <laughs> oh no! So, so what do you do in the what do you do then in the meanwhile? Oh. Right. So you, nice. Right. Just to get out and yes. Yeah. Right. It's I know, and I and I felt I felt like, oh, I can't do this. You know, you got to put your head down to the in, to the grindstone and just trudge through. This is what I need to be doing. That's not. But once I got out and felt it, I went, oh my, I have to have this. I mean, it just it's it's what within that um, workshop it was the the spirit part of it, talking about you know just the community connection that you need to have. And I saw that with my grandmother who um, was an avid horse rider and she passed away at 90 but she would constantly say how she was just so lonely and um, you know she had her animals and whatnot but she wasn't getting out like she used to and um, a big thing for her was she would go out and take these treks and she would go um, buy furniture or clothes and kind of swapping stuff all the time. We called her the the quintessential horse trader because she was always buying and swapping and buying and swapping whether it was a car or a horse or a <laughs> but when she stopped doing that and they took her car away because she was getting to places and she couldn't remember how to get back sometimes and that started happening um, after I moved out there uh, I was talking with my mom I said I don't see any issues and then a year later when she was about 89 I said okay I'm seeing some and so they said, we really are afraid. And they took her car. And when the car was taken away, she just, yeah. So, and her parents passed away when they were 94 and 99. And they were driving back and forth to Florida up until their 90s. <laughs> so, I mean, they had that strong 
ethic of, uh, you know, just the work. I mean, they're all farmers. It's all down the line on each side of my family, so. It's tough when you're dealing with that. Right. 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 Instead of being thrown into the, just, you know. Right. I mean, my grandmother, at all costs, said she did not want to go any place. She wanted to stay in her home. But my grandfather, who they were divorced when she was about 20, he was put into assisted living and just loved it because he was a very social, he liked to go down to do the social things um, while he could. Um, and his wasn't a mental issue, his was myasthenia gravis, which is one that just kind of takes your body where you can't have the, the muscles don't work anymore. So um, he was still aware, but he couldn't physically do stuff. So yeah, that is tough. I mean, people have all sorts of different connections though, and we just have to keep those. Do you guys have anything other than Mm. Activities, right? Right. Right. Love it. Right, I hear about that. I mean, my my um, aunt and uncle actually are what in a late 50, early 60. He retired, and they have a place down in Florida where they'll go back and forth. And they said we have this place where you know people are out walking around. It's a bunch of the mobile homes, but everybody gets together and does stuff, and um, and that's very important for for whatever the ties are that you need, um, family, friends, or otherwise. You need to keep that because it's definitely. Again, I've seen it firsthand with myself, with the moods. Um, so, um, okay, so as far as nutrition, um, let me just see. Okay, so there's a long video that I am going to have you listen. Not long, it's like five minutes. But um, she talks about the omega-3, the importance of that. The sugar, it's role in the mood and immune system. Fermented foods, food high in zinc, and chocolate. And so, of course, over there I brought a smattering of things. I, I brought in protein drinks because, um, for me, that's just something easy that I do in the morning. I have my shaker cup. I put in my unsweetened almond milk, and then I put my protein in. And as a semi-vegetarian, I typically lack in protein. And so that's an easy way for me to get about 20 grams. And it's also easy for me because in the morning I'm... I have what I call like a, our little mini farm. I have a couple of horses and um, chickens and uh, rabbit, and I've got two dogs and four cats. So I'm always trying to get everybody all situated with, and my daughter in the morning. And then this morning I was trying to get out there and do the snowblower. Which, so, um, you know, I'm the last on the list. So it's easy for me to have that to grab and then go out the door, and I have it, I drink it on my way into work. And I feel really satisfied. Well, who forgot to do that this morning? Me. So I felt a little off because I didn't have that for me. But 
I brought a few of them up there, some of my favorite ones, and um, just some chocolate. And she talks about, um, I think she mentioned 70, 70 or 72 percent chocolate. And I just read a study done by, um, or I don't know if it was, I forget who actually did it, but um, a university did a study with chocolate, dark chocolate, 72 percent, and stress. And what they did was, is they gave a group some dark chocolate, and then they gave another group, they actually simulated the look and the taste and whatnot of um, dark chocolate, but they weren't getting dark chocolate at all. And they threw at these people these very extremely stressful situations. They had to like figure math problems out as they had questions being fired at them, and they were measuring their cortisol levels somehow. And so they said that the group that actually had the dark chocolate, their cortisol levels were much, much lower than the group that had the fake dark chocolate. So I like that study because I am a proponent of dark chocolate. I mean, I have some typically every day. And um, I usually have the 88% because I find that if I have even just the 72, I still can have more of that than I should. So when I have the 88%, it's just one square, and I feel very satisfied with that amount. So, um, But she'll talk in here a little bit more about the foods. There are so many things that you can do when it comes to nutrition um, to help really promote good winter health, right? So the things that we've been talking about are what can you do to improve mood or support mood and what can you do to support the immune system? Well, when we look to the diet, I think it's very important that you try to really limit your sugar and carbohydrate, you know, very, what we used to call simple carbohydrates or high glycemic load carbohydrates. These actually have a suppressing effect on the immune system. And you know, there's also been some correlation with high processed food diets and depression. So we really want you focusing on more wholesome types of foods. If you need something for the sweet, maybe a little chocolate. Chocolate is wonderful, especially if you purchase dark chocolate, you know, at least 70% of the cacao. And, and this has many things. It can promote cardiovascular health. You may not know that. But it also has compounds in it which also seem to be protective of the mood. So, so chocolate is a wonderful way. A little bit of dark chocolate a few times a week may help cut those sugar cravings and are definitely better for you. When we think of other things that really are good for immune and mood health, the omega-3 sources have to really float up to the top. You know, you can get omega-3s either from animals or from plants. Plants contain alpha-linolenic acid. So things like walnuts, that's the, that's the nut actually, the tree nut that's highest in omega-3s. Or, or other things like flaxseed or chia. Um, these can be added to the diet, easily ground and, and put into the diet. Uh, you know, flaxseed in your smoothie, in your cereal, your porridge, etc. Now, fish. A lot of people are worried about mercury in fish. I understand that. Um, but, you know, I, I think if you stick with the, the low mercury, high omega-3 fish, you know, the wild Alaskan um, salmons, um, you know, sardines, if you enjoy these, um, I mean, but, but pollock, other kinds of things that are low in mercury but that are good sources of omega-3s, these are so important. You know, isn't it interesting? You know, when I was a kid, my grandmother told me fish was brain food. She told me that when I was a little child. Now, for people who really just aren't going to eat much fish, load up on your vegetarian sources, but you may also want to consider taking an omega-3 supplement if, if seafood is just something you never take. I would, I would especially encourage it during the winter months. It's interesting over the years, one of the things that I have found with many of my patients are that they have moved to a higher carbohydrate, high glycemic load sort of carbohydrate diet, and they've really minimized the protein, healthy protein sources in their diet. You need adequate amounts of protein for you to be able to build and repair and for your immune system to work efficiently, for you to be able to heal. I mean, protein is vitally important for every cell in the body. I think as we move into autumn and you're coming into winter, I want you to be creative about the protein that you use. I mean, it can be easily added to soups. Uh, chicken and fish are wonderful sources of protein. Uh, those of you who do not consume a meat uh, in, in your diet, uh, there are great vegetable sources of, of protein as well. And please don't make it all processed soy. Processed soy in many cases is as bad as just most other kinds of junk food. Whole soy, whole soy products, lots of legumes, beans, things like this are really, really healthy in the diet. 
The average adult, this varies a little bit, um, needs between 50 and 60 grams of protein per day. So if you find that you are craving uh, you know, a candy bar in the afternoon, you're craving sweets, I want you to think about having a small amount of high protein. Um, and, and this could be almonds, it could be some almond butter, um, you know, th things that you can snack on that, that give you adequate protein. If you find that protein is difficult for you to get into your diet, you actually may want to even consider supplementing with uh, some protein powders and that that you could add and use in your smoothies, um, like for breakfast or for snacks. But protein, many people who crave sugar actually require protein. <laughs> like how she does that. Um, I actually experienced that myself and after I had watched this and I thought, oh yeah, it's that afternoon. And I've had a lot of clients um, tell me that they've used different things. Some you drank a lot of water and that pepped them right back up for the afternoon. Some use extra vitamin Ds and that actually peps them back. Or they have a green drink that gives them that extra pep. Well, usually I'll have, that's when I have my dark chocolate. <laughs> so I was really sitting there craving, craving. I thought, oh, I want to have something more sweet. And I thought, and I, I don't remember what I ate that day because it was a while back. But I thought, you know what, I'm going to go out and I'm going to go get one of our tuna wraps and have that. And I did, and then I really wasn't craving any more sugary. And so that was the, the protein in place of the sugar. So I thought, oh, that really works. So, you know, when I worked with diabetics, too, uh, when I was doing my internship and people that had uh, diabetic ulcers, they had them on a very, very high, high-protein diet to help with the healing. So again, if there's anything within you that needs more with the healing, that's when you need more protein sources. Now, um, typically, to figure out how much protein you need, you take your body weight, you divide it by 2.2, which gives you your body weight in kilograms, and then that's actually how much you would need for the day. Um, so, if, like I said, a protein drink for me is easy right off the bat. I get 20 from that. And then usually I'll have one of our salads that either has some eggs or some um, tuna on there. And then I might ha I typically have some of those kind bars that have the nuts in there, and so there's more protein. So um, because I actually one time on one of my labs had my protein come up to be very low, and I've never had that before. So I thought, oh, apparently I have to be aware of this more. And I have started to incorporate salmon, the wild-caught Alaskan salmon, into my diet, but I have to be honest with you, I only have it once every, you know, rare, or once every maybe two months or so. Uh, so typically I cook it up and my daughter has it, she devours it, and I put some pesto on top of it, and she just, I give her a nice size filet, and she'll say, can I have more? So I give her more of that instead of for myself. So... Um, but again, that's, that's very important with the nutrition because as I said, we typically crave carbs this time of year, more carbs. I know growing up I would, oh, my mom was a great cook on all <laughs> aspects. And so the macaroni and cheese, homemade macaroni and cheese. But I can't tolerate the gluten now and now she'll make things gluten free for me. But even still, like last night I had something that she made and I don't think that was gluten free. But it was a combination of some sort of a cream cheese, and it was a carrot muffin that she had made. And then I had a, a small piece of the Amy's, um, and that one wasn't gluten-free either, uh, pizza. And I was just in digestive distress after that. And I had had some cheese on my salad earlier, and I thought, what is it? Because I was okay up until that point, and I think once I had the, the combination of the dairy and then the gluten, my my digestive system doesn't like that. It just kind of shuts down at that point, and I get cramping and whatnot. So um, I have to be very careful. I find that when I've kept a food log, I did this for a whole year, um, I found the days that I had no grains whatsoever, and I had, say, my protein drink, and then I might have some nuts and seeds, and I'll have a salad for lunch and maybe eggs for dinner. Those days I actually digest the best, and clarity and energy-wise is how I feel the best. So... Um, you know, just try to think about things like that for yourself if you do feel like you're going down. I actually was just talking two days ago with a client, and he wasn't putting together 
his food and mood. And there's so many books out there on this that I'm just kind of very surprised that people aren't aware of how connected the food and mood is. And um, I asked him if he craved a lot of carbohydrates, and he said yes. And he had issues with um, depression and um, some other uh, mental health issues, too. And I said, really, you need to start taking a food log and, and note how you feel at least a half hour after you're eating a food item and see if you feel like you're going downward. And I had a couple that were working together, and they typically she craved chocolates and sweets and and um, carbs more, and he he craved candies because he um, grew up living above a candy store and was allowed to just <laughs> go there at free will. And so he has this love affair with typically when his mood goes down that that's what he has a go-to. So um, I got them on some supplements and had them change their foods around, and they're doing phenomenal. They, they're not feeling that, like, dip that they usually do this time of year. Yes? Right. Exactly. Right. It's a temporary. <laughs> it's a temporary fix. It's a temporary fix, and we know it. We get a sugar Yeah. Cereal. Cereal is like the worst. It's, it's guys, yeah, like they say it's breakfast cereal. And it's interesting because I typically don't give cereals to my daughter, but I did, I thought, well, I just am trying to vary it up. Sometimes she'll have yogurt and she'll put some granola in it, or she'll just have uh, one of those kind chewy bars. Um, some Oh, yeah, it is not the fat. Yep. You're right. I know. Well, I know. I was trying to get some, um, what was it, sweet potatoes. I just wanted to have some that were already cut up, and I could just mm -hmm. stick them in the oven. Mm -hmm. And I was looking, and they all had some kind of sugar added in. And I was like, well, why are they doing that? when you take it away. that with my daughter she actually because she's a chocolate lover too but dark chocolate you know I <laughs> and she, so I had some of the um, baking dark for for I don't know I was making something with it so we make some of these um, we, I call them energy balls so it's peanut butter mixed in with some ca pure cacao powder and I use a little bit of maple syrup and some oats and so I got it for that and she opened it she went oh and I said no that's just that's that's not what you're thinking and she just immediately like licked her fingers and put them in. She went, "Oh, this is so good." And I went, oh, "That's a pure cacao powder." Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And it's interesting with my daughter. Again, she's been exposed to this since she was little. She would make comments when we were at the grocery store and say. Why are those people buying 
non-organic foods. And I said, well, they don't know what we know. And then she was at school trying to get, you know, ice creams like some of the other kids. And I said, well, I get you the organic stuff here if you want that. And she said, well, I just want to have something at school. And I went to the school one time when it was her birthday, and I was checking them out, and they were all, except for the plain vanilla ones. And, of course, she didn't want that. And I said, you know those colorings, those dyes? I said, they're cancer-causing, they're bad for you. And so I asked her one day what she had, and she said, oh, but it only had a little bit of green something, I said. And she said, is that cancer-causing, those colors? And I said, yes, they are. So, I mean, she's very, very aware of that stuff. So, um, but yet she'll kind of bypass it on occasion. And I can't be like a, you know, food Nazi over her. But I try as much as possible to not. But um, she loves, I mean, I have pictures of her. Like I said, she'll devour the fish and um, avocados. I would just mush them up. And I wouldn't even be able to make them into guacamole. I would just mush them. And I have pictures of her when she was little. And she was just eating it by the handful. Same thing with hummus. Her hands were in there and she was just eating it. She loves it. So... She loves the good fats, and yes, even adults now I have to let them know. They're surprised when they find out fats don't equal fat still, and I said it's not that. It's 95% of the people that I see in there that have to lose weight. It's the carbohydrate and sugar-ish. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So these. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some supplements. Um, we have the American ginseng, reishi mushroom, and the vitamin D, which we'll be talking about. So she's got videos on. Oh, there. Okay, so reishi, ginseng. Okay, I think it's which one that I want. All right, in celebration of one of our other amazing North American herbs, I want to talk to you for a moment about American ginseng, Panax quinquefolius. So Panax is interesting. That's the botanical name, the species name. And what that means is panacea, right? Cure-all. Now, don't be turned off by that. It's just simply that ginseng um, in Asia and in North America, it was considered to be so powerful. It was so effective for so many things. People said, oh, it's a panacea. It's just great for everything. Quinquefolius means five lobes, right? So the ginseng leaf, the five lobes of the ginseng leaf. I love American ginseng. Um, I love Asian ginseng as well. I think for most Americans, though, the American variety or species is better because it's not quite as heating. It's not quite as stimulating. Most Americans are stimulated enough. American ginseng has a wonderful, wonderful sort of tonifying or strengthening effect on the immune system as well as that whole adrenal gland, right? And when the body is under more stress, we're more at risk for infection. We're more at risk for getting sick. You know this around holiday times, right? We're going out to parties. We're staying up late. The whole stress, good or bad, of the holiday season makes us more vulnerable for getting sick. So I often recommend adaptogens during the winter season and one that's not too heating but is warming, not cold, right? So American ginseng is one of my favorite adaptogens. Adaptogen just means it helps your body adapt to stress and stressors. And winter can be filled with holidays, filled with extreme um, temperature differences. Um, you may want to consider, if you're looking for an adaptogen this winter, uh, you may want to think about American ginseng grown right here in our own country. So in the past, we really spent a lot more time outdoors. We lived outside, and we were outside a lot more. And I think that you know sometimes people wonder why vitamin D3 deficiency is so prevalent. And now we're, we're living our lives primarily indoors. And when we do go outside, we usually put lots of sunscreen on right before we even step out the door. So we really have that ability to manufacture our vitamin D3 with adequate sunlight. But D3 is really an issue, and especially in the winter months. I agree. And, you know, um, you do need a lot of places, like we're here in New Mexico right now, mm -hmm. and so we have lots of sun. And so if you're out quite a lot in the, in the summer, uh, spring, summer, fall, you can get enough sun to last you through the winter. Some people, though, who live much in more northern latitudes, you know, sort of north of Denver and that, um, 
they, the, even if they're out in the summer, they're going to have some hard time keeping up enough vitamin D to get them all the way through the winter. We think that this, this fall in vitamin D, the, the d diminished levels, may also contribute to why we see more flu and why we see more upper respiratory infections during the deep winter months. Uh, because vitamin D has a very important role to play in our immune, uh, our immune response in the immune system. Um, so most people think of vitamin D as primarily for your bones, right, for bone health. But it really is not, you have to think of it more of a hormone uh, than you do a vitamin. And it's very, very important for cardiovascular health and immune health, et cetera. So um, during the winter months, I do recommend that people, um, even if they don't supplement during the summer, I, I encourage my patients to supplement during the winter um, with 1,000 international units of vitamin D3. This is important for, uh, for immune health and important for you just keeping maintaining those vitamin D levels throughout the year. And one of the things that I love about this as well, when we look at vitamin D3, is it, it also ties into mood. Right. Our other theme in the winter. Right. Vitamin D is... Um, it's, again, more hormonally related mm -hmm. um, than I think most people... Um, recognize. And so vitamin D, you want to keep it fairly stable throughout the year. So again, if you're down in my part of the country, you may not need to supplement if you go out and get adequate sunlight, especially during the summer months. You'll have a reserve to last you through the winter. But the older you get, the harder it is to manufacture vitamin D from the skin. Uh, so as you get older, supplementing with vitamin D is probably important during the winter no matter where you live. Uh, and for many people, supplementing all year long is probably not a bad idea. So, as I said with that before, you know, vitamin D is considered a neural hormone. They're now seeing with people with Alzheimer's and dementia, um, very, very low levels of vitamin D. Uh, also, it's linked in with all autoimmune diseases when it's very, very low. Um, and cancers, a lot of cancers are linked in with, um, it, when they looked at estrogen-related cancers in the body, Typically, women had lower levels at the receptor sites of D and iodine and selenium. So you really want to make sure that those are kept um, at a good level. And uh, like I said, I tell people usually around September to start supplementing with your vitamin D. Um, I give my daughter at least 2,000, and she's only 7, and I myself take about 4. Um, Again, when she's sick, I kind of bump it up a little bit higher. But um, it's interesting how this year she's had a few, like, sniffles and whatnot, but nothing major, and there were all these major um, viruses that were going on out there that were mostly affecting individuals that had uh, any kind of respiratory issues with asthma um, or elderly that had issues. They were finding mostly with children. But... Um, that's one that we really should keep on top of because it's linked so heavily in with our immune system is the vitamin D. So continue to keep yours until you get it up at least to that 50 mark. Um, and typically people, like for myself, and it's different for everybody as far as your absorption, because it is fat soluble, you need to have it with a, a meal with some fat in there. And uh, because they did see that people that were just taking vitamin D whenever and they weren't taking it with some fat food, that their levels were much lower, and once they started incorporating it with a meal with some fat, that all of a sudden their levels started to rise after that. So I took one um, that we have here that I think has some isoflavones and other things in there, and I took a 2,000 one. I was just doing it sporadically every few days or so, and after two months I tested, go, I think it was in like 32, and after that it had gone up to 54. So it was at a nice level. So. Um, I know during the weekends I will miss it, so that's why I'm okay, I think, with taking the 4,000 because it all kind of levels off. Um, so that is a big one. And any of these supplements, I have to put that caveat out there, that if you're on any medications, don't just take them because any of these, natural or not, could interfere with um, some medications. So like the ginseng is a great one. I mean, they talk about adaptogens. If there's a lot of stress, you need to take something more like for your adrenals. Okay. All right, so now we're going to be getting into vitamin C and echinacea and elderberry and zinc. And um, she has a nice video on those. Elderberry, 
Okay, so first I'm going to do these here. One of my other favorites for the cold and flu season is elderberry. Elderberry, the whole tree is just, I mean, it's a beautiful tree. The flowers have long been treasured and valued for their diaphoretic properties or their ability to sort of help lower fever. The name Sambucus, um, which is actually, the, Sambucus is the name of elder, the botanical name, that's um, in reference to an ancient wind instrument that was actually made from the elder tree. I mean, this was, this was a tree that was revered in, in carpentry and, and in building and in making instruments. The berries are edible, and they're the part that I really want to focus on right now. Elder berries have very powerful antiviral activity, especially against flu virus. Now, there's been several clinical studies where they've actually given this to people who've had the flu, and it's shown that it's shortened the duration and the severity of, of the influenza. Elderberry has antiviral activity against many things, not just flu, but other things that cause upper respiratory tract infections. One of the things that I like about elderberry is that it's a food, that it's very safe, it has a great safety profile, can be used in young and old alike. When you're using it for acute situations, you need to use enough, right? So the dose that we focus on is five to 6,000 milligrams or five to six grams of the berries, of the crude berries, taken you know, four or five times a day. You need to be frequent with it to make sure that you're really giving the body what it needs. Elderberry, for me, kind of matches, goes along with echinacea. They, they, they marry together very well. They give you a little bit broader perspective um, a, a protection against flu virus. Echinacea mounts the immune response. Elderberry has direct antiviral activity. So when you put the two of them together, the echinacea is revving up the immune system but doesn't have a lot of antiviral activity. The elderberry has direct antiviral activity, and so it's directly helping your body fight specifically the viruses that may be um, inhabiting the respiratory tract. So when you look at the two together, they make a beautiful combination for cold and flu. So one of my hands-down favorite remedies for winter is echinacea. I grew up with this plant. It's definitely one of my favorites. You know, echinacea actually comes from the Greek word echinos, which means hedgehog. And if you've ever looked at the top of an echinacea plant, you'll see that the cone actually does kind of look like a hedgehog. Now, it was highly valued by the indigenous peoples of North America where it is native. And it was used for coughs and congestion and sore throats. It was also used topically for wounds, both in people and in animals and horses. And many states call this by, you know, whatever the state's name is, and then snake root. So Kansas snake root, Missouri snake root, because one of the big things it was also used for was as a remedy for snake bite. Now, I'm not saying that this is the one I would use or that I would use an herb for treating snake bites, but I will tell you it is my hands down go-to for colds and upper respiratory infections, especially if you take it right at the onset. You know, when you come home from work or you get home from school and you're feeling like, wow, I'm getting that scratchy throat, I'm starting to feel a little low-grade temperature, you feel that cold coming on, that's the time to take echinacea. Now, the studies are somewhat mixed for colds. I mean, it is. But this is the one I'll just tell you, in my own clinical experience using it, probably more than 1,000 people in my career, um, this is the one that most people say, I believe herbs work. Right? This is the one that kind of convinces them. This, you can use the upper parts of the plant, so the aerial parts, often of echinacea, purpurea are used, purpurea meaning, purpura meaning um, purple. But the Echinacea angustifolia, oftentimes it's the root that's used, right? That's what I have here. Now you can take Echinacea in a variety of ways. You can take it as a tea, you can take it in tincture, you can take it in capsules, you can take it in powder. I mean, the main point here is if you're going to use Echinacea, use it soon, as soon as you start to feel bad, which is why I tell people, keep it in the house. You don't want to be on the night you don't feel well trying to go down to buy it someplace. This is one that really belongs in the kitchen cupboard for you and your kids. Now, I have to put this out there, that echinacea, because it does rev the immune system, anybody with an autoimmune would be steer clear from this product because it overstimulates the immune system, okay? Is there anyone, uh, we're going to get into the um, next ones, vitamin C and zinc, but is there any, anybody that has a favorite that they use this time of year that they would share? I kind of use a bunch of different things depending on 
Well, I have a few favorites, actually, but I was just curious if anybody did for preventative or once they do get sick, anything favorite that you have? Zinc. Yeah, that's a big popular one, zinc. Zinc lozenges or the little that you suck on, the lozenges. Oh, thieves. I love thieves. I know, the clove and... Is it clove? Cinnamon. I know. I. Oh, very nice. I know. Oh, yeah. Some people, I know that w one woman worked in a hospital, and um, she was always flying a lot because she was, I think she was a medical sales or something. So she would put it on her, like the tip of her nose before she went in, um, or she would put it on her chest before she got on the airplane to make sure that, you know, it was like, right there when she was breathing it. And you can also put thieves at, at home if there's someone sick. You can put it into the, um, on the stove and have it diffuse. Yeah, I don't have a diffuser, so I just put the, but I also need the, um, the uh, water in the air because my house gets so dry. So I do the combination, but I haven't done that in a while. But we, we also carry the hand sanitizers, which is one of my favorites. And we have the soap pumps that are out there. Yeah, so thieves is in the throat, throat spray. Have you yeah, ever? Yeah. Sure. I bet you like the cinnamon and stuff in there is very right, right. So a carrier oil. Right. And plus the, the the places that they say for us to put are on our hands and on our feet because that's where there's the most of the um, absorptive, what do I want to say, not absorptive, but the uh, the pores, most pores. So like if you're having trouble sleeping, that, that's why they would say put lavender on the bottom of your feet so it would, you know, draw, draw into the body. Mm -hmm. Anything else, anybody with any? Yep, essential oil. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the favorite ones that I use, uh, Umka. Are you guys familiar with the Umka out there? Actually, I used to work for a company called Nature's Way, which uh, puts out Umka. And um, I had seen the studies on that, and it's a phenomenal product. Anytime I get anything with my chest, um, actually the word is Umka Lawabo, and it's an African word. And it comes from the African geranium plant. And, th and what it means is, it's something dealing with the respiratory tract. So they'll typically use it, and they've seen in studies that it's beneficial with um, bronchitis, tonsillitis, the common cold, like how the elderberry cuts the flu duration in half um, in the, the length of time and the severity. The umka actually cuts the cold in half in severity and duration. So um, even with my daughter, when she was young, I used the one that was the original one. It's the purple dropper one and it's got alcohol in there, so it's got that, you know, it goes down and it's kind of, you feel the burning going on. But I also feel like that's actually the, the heat in it, and it just soothes as it's going down into your chest because you can kind of feel that, like how you would put the, um, what is it you put on, you rub on your chest, the, the Vic, the, the, that warming feeling, that's how it is internally when you take that. Umka, and I use, yep, it's the purple dropper, not the, all the other ones that they've come out with after. I just prefer the original one that they did the studies on um, because the others are sort of, not all of them, but there are some of them, like the other uh, um, syrups are diluted down, so you have to take more of it. But this one is just the straight Umka with some alcohol in there, and I use probably um, two to four dropperfuls four times a day. <laughs> just to try to hit it hard and fast. And that's usually what I'll do with my daughter, and she just loves it. So um, I also do extra vitamin D, and then um, when things aren't kicking it enough, I throw in some colloidal silver, because that's a big one for me that actually starts anything that I have, um, in, because I don't do the neti pot regularly. Um, I'll just do it down my throat, and um, I also use the X-Clear, which is a xylitol, which adheres to the bacteria, and then the colloidal silver kills. 
So I'll do those two together, and that typically cuts any kind of um, sinus issue that I get. So, and there's a lot of products. There's so many to choose from, so many. But um, your basic ones are good too, like the uh, the next ones, which are your zinc. Um, we've already talked about vitamin D and also C. Another nutrient that's very important for your health during the winter season, or all year long really, is zinc. Now during those winter months, I want you to really focus on getting more zinc foods in the diet. If you're not a vegetarian, beef and chicken are great sources. When we're looking at vegetarian sources, we've got lentils, we've got chickpeas, and of course pumpkin seeds. These are all great sources of zinc that you can add to your diet. Now when we look at zinc and its role in immune protection during the winter time, it's fascinating. We have found that in children, when you give them zinc every day, that over a five month period, it reduces the number of times they get upper respiratory infections, it re reduces antibiotic use, and it reduces um, days that are absent from school. So kids need zinc. They're growing fast, and zinc is very important for their immune health. They're more at risk for upper respiratory infections anyway. Most kids get on average four to eight colds per, per winter season. So um, making sure that they're getting adequate zinc is important. But it's not just for kids. Adults need zinc as well. Zinc has been shown to shorten the duration and severity of a cold. So when you actually get sick, taking zinc, more than vitamin C has been shown to shorten the duration and severity of that cold. So zinc is very important for overall immune health, and it's one that you want to make sure that you're getting adequate amounts of in your diet throughout the winter months. And if you should start getting sick with a cold, consider taking zinc, um, zinc in your diet, powder, lozenges, um, you know, as a tablet. But you want to make sure that you're getting zinc in your diet to make sure that you can fight off that infection quickly and effectively. So we all know the importance of vitamin C. Vitamin C is incredibly important for our overall health. It has a lot to do with wound healing. It's vitally important for the immune system. I mean, Linus Pauling, I think we have to credit him with really bringing forward this notion that vitamin C is far more important than most of us really realized. It was more than just you know, preventing scurvy. Now, you can get vitamin C. If you're eating lots of fruits and vegetables, you're going to get lots of vitamin C. And if you're eating those seven to nine servings of vegetables and fruits every day, you're probably getting somewhere between three and 500 milligrams um, per day. And that's probably what you need optimally for, for really maintaining health. So vitamin C um, supplementation, people have studied this for colds, and the data is a little mixed, actually. When we look at prevention, though, people who are more in extreme kinds of situations, meaning they're exposed to more inclement weather, um, it's much colder where they're at, they're um, athletic or endurance um, athletes, they're soldiers, people who are ex uh, have more heavy um, labor, um, more athletic or in more inclement weather, they actually have found that that's the group vitamin C seems to work the best in, reducing upper respiratory infections by as much as 50% in a year. Now for the rest of us maybe who are, don't, don't fit for any of those, vitamin C is just important for us for our overall health. And of course during the winter season, taking a little more vitamin C to kind of protect yourself and to give that immune system a little extra boost is probably a good idea for all of us. So increase your fruits and vegetables throughout the year, especially during the winter. And if you're somebody who's probably not, maybe not getting enough, you may want to consider just supplementing with a little bit of vitamin C as well. I prefer whole supplements of vitamin C. I really like everything in it. I want the bioflavonoid. You know, I want everything that was in that orange, not just the ascorbic acid. Um, so look for, for more whole forms of vitamin C when you're supplementing. So that was very important with the zinc. You saw how important they were saying with that. And I have a lot of people that use that as well and swear by that. Um, the last one is andrographis. An herb that you may be less familiar with um, in the United States is called andrographis. Now, andrographis is native to Asia. In Ayurveda, it's known as the king of bitters, right? So it's a very bitter-tasting herb, which is why it's so good for digestion, right? It really enhances digestion, revs that up, and gets that working better. 
But the other thing it is renowned for is infect, an infection. During the global pandemic of influenza in 1918-1919, what people refer to as the Spanish flu, I would remind you that that flu killed 1% of the entire global population. It was horrible. One of the herbs that sort of rose to fame in that part of the world was andrographis because it was used um, during the flu and it purportedly was, was quite helpful. Now, andrographis today is used for upper respiratory infections, and there is a combination, um, particularly that's been studied, that uses eleuthero or Siberian ginseng with andrographis. That combination has been studied extensively and shown to really reduce upper respiratory infection, both the duration and severity when you get it, as well as act to prevent. Now, how much the eleuthero is doing there, that's an adaptogen, I think one could debate. I think the real powerhouse in here is the andrographis. Uh, the andrographis has that powerful sort of antiviral activity. Um, it has a very good safety profile for it. Um, it contains a group of compounds, andrographolides, and I'm just telling you, I think we're going to hear more and more about it in this country as the research continues to grow. But an ancient herb known for thousands of years, this king of bitters, is also, I think, king for the immune system. Okay, so this product um, all together is in this, which I put on your um, chair. Now, again, as she was saying, it, the andrographis is extremely bitter, okay? And they, they kind of say bitter gets you better, in a sense, because um, I guess the bitters are what are shown to stimulate the liver, kidneys, and respiratory system and even cool the body down from heat from a fever. So when I got this, I really wasn't thinking that much about, uh, I said, oh, it looks beautiful. Uh, I think it's going to taste great. So I put it in some water, a big mug of water, and I thought I was just going to kind of sip on it. And it was awful. I have to tell you, it was awful. And, and I said, oh, my gosh, people aren't going to take this. And um, so I was going back and forth with, with um, some of the reps, and I said, well, how, do you, how are you getting people to take this? Because I said it's awful. I mean, a lot of the stuff that you take out there doesn't taste that great, but, you know, you're not going to be able to get a kid or some other people to, to take this. And obviously you don't want sweets because sweets depress your immune system, and that's not what you need. So um, what they had said is to just kind of put it in like a little – two to three ounces instead of what they say here, which is six to eight, which is what I did. I thought, oh, put it in just, you just put it in a little bit and shoot it down. That's basically what you have to do is just down and done with. They did say you could mix it in with a little bit of, um, I guess the consensus was pineapple juice, but, you know, that's, again, you're adding in some sugary sweetness. And so um, I prefer actually just putting in a tiny bit and shooting it down because I've had to take different herbs that were it tasted like dirt and they were horrible and it said to mix it with a whole bunch of water and I said no this is a little bit of torture right here so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in a little tiny bit of water and shoot it down so I'm just done with it so this it says on here for best results take one serving three times a day for five days at the onset so this is like you jump on top of it right away and this has in there the zinc it has the vitamin C it has the elderberry it has the echinacea, the um, andrographis, and I guess it's the andrographis in here primarily that is what tastes bitter, okay? And I've taken andrographis in other forms. Um, there's some other companies that I um, used prior to this because this is a very brand new product um, that was a pill form, and you took it every two hours for, I don't know how much, 12 hours or so, and then after that, for five days after, you took it three times a day. So once you started coming down with anything respiratory, feeling a little icky, you just you know hit it very hard and fast. Usually, like with the Umka and like these products, you want to get it within that first 24 to 48 hours. So that would be three times a day. So um, I have more, and if you want a few more, I can give you more because we don't have a lot of people. <laughs> So I can do that. So if you want to have this for, God forbid, if that does happen, um, this isn't preventative. This is once it comes on. We've talked about other preventative stuff, but once this comes on, you just start hitting it hard with this stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah, 
Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. That's true, yeah. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, you're going to have a little, you might chase it with something, but <laughs> exactly. Right. I would get cola syrup, and I actually got, um, I had had, for ear infections growing up, I used to have the medication smushed up into grape jelly. To this day, I will not even touch grape jelly because it's just so, you know, um, and cola syrup. I mean, not that I would, I don't drink soda, but anytime I smelled Coca-Cola, it just like, it put me right into that mode of like, oh my gosh, disgusting. I smell it and it's just disgusting. So this is the last slide. This is actually in your book and it has lines underneath it. So you can put together your plan. Like for instance, when I'm looking at this, I definitely think that I need to do more with a nitty pot. You know, that, as you had impressed upon it and others, that that's very, very important. Um, even like there's some nasal sprays that I, I like out there that have a nice um, minty and I just, some people just don't like anything going up there and I understand it's a weird sensation but as you said it's, it's, a, it's a great area for the bear, yeah exactly, 